Hello. Um, I am going to make someone else co-host so that I don't have to look at the waiting room anymore. There we go, Sarah. Now you're co-host. Anyway, hello. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director of All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm going to share screen and get us all oriented. Today we'll be continuing our conversation about interdependence, interdependence at work. Brain Club, of course, is our community conversation about everyday brain life. I think we have some folks this might be your first Brain Club. Welcome. Um, this is our education space for the broader collective ABB community to educate about neurodiversity and all kinds of topics related to inclusive community. Um, we, we, we always say at the start that this is for education purposes only, this is not a support group, this is not medical or mental health advice. All forms of participation are okay. Um, as many of you have figured out, you can have your video on or off. Uh, and even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to like look at the camera or sit still or anything. So feel free to fidget, stim, eat, all the things. And everyone's welcome and all formats of communication are welcome. So you can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. You can, you know, however you're comfortable communicating. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important to us to respect and protect the group's collective access needs. And we want to make sure that anything anyone needs to feel safe and comfortable is is, is respected and protected. Um, we do have direct messaging enabled. Um, if you're uncomfortable for any reason, you can send a direct message to Lizzie, our education programs coordinator. Lizzie, can you uh, wave or something? There you go, that's Lizzie. Yeah, Lizzie's gonna see a direct message a lot sooner than I will when I'm in share screen mode. All right, um, I think we're all right. So before we get started, oh, time out. Um, I, I clicked too hard and I skipped a bunch of slides. I, I just wanna say that closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you can click either the live transcript closed captioning icon, or if you don't see that, the more dot, 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 and choose show subtitles or hide subtitles if you change your mind. Okay, an announcement. Today, just a few hours ago, in fact, All Brains Belong launched a new project. This is a project that the uh, the collective ABB Village has been working on for a year and a half. Um, oh, I just switched this. They're in the wrong order. That's all. All right. So that's uh, that's that's what closed captioning looks like. Um, all right. Okay. And that's what the chat window looks like. And that's my now. I'm, now I'm opening it. Okay. Great. So the project. So everything is connected to everything, improving the healthcare of autistic and ADHD adults. Although the project really. Uh, I, I think applies to a much broader population. Um, what we know is that autistic and ADHD adults, in addition to a broader population of people, experience multiple intertwined medical conditions. For example, hypermobility, mast cell dysfunction, migraine, POTS, dysautonomia, a whole cluster or constellation of interrelated conditions. And unfortunately, the, some of the standard medical management for some parts of that constellation make the other parts worse. Um, it's like internal conflicting access needs. So, you know, for example, if someone has chronic pain and they end up taking a muscle relaxant, but they also have an underlying connective tissue problem and their, their, their tissue is like soft and stretchy, um, well, it turns out that muscle relaxant might make that worse. And if in fact they have a sleep disorder, because that's part of the cluster, um, that muscle relaxant and the floppy tissue might make that worse, which then makes the heart problem worse. And it's all just very um, intertwined. And so um, with support from the Organization on Autism Research and HRSA's Grant on Autism Intervention Research Network for Physical Health, um, we launched a, 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 a guide an educational resource that was co-created with input from more than 100 autistic and ADHD folks from our community um, that has health information in both, um, you know, stories, videos, graphics, text. It has some strategies for how to communicate with primary care clinicians about the project. 
Um, and there's a clinician guide that merges evidence-based practice with lived experience um, from a whole lot of people. So um, anyway, that's the QR code. That's the website. Um, we hope it's helpful and feel free to share it with anyone else who you think would be interested. And it's greatly ironic that today we're going to be talking about interdependent teams because there has been so much interdependent teamwork to make this project happen. Um, every month we talk about some aspect of employment. These are some of the past conversations. Um, all of the archives are available on the Brain Club website. All the recordings are available for free. Um, but we've not engaged interdependence and employment directly before. So I think this is, this is going to be exciting. Well, we talk about a lot, of course, in these employment conversations, neuroinclusive employment conversations, is that a lot of people end up in situations where they are the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole. And what happens, you break the peg. That's why we have, you know, it's one of the many contributions to neurodivergent burnout, for example. Um, and it's, it's, there's gotta be a better way. So especially when we think about how Disability, at least for the past 25 years, the World Health Organization has defined disability according to the social model of disability. It's not issues of the individual. Uh, it's, it's, it's about how many barriers to access there are from the environment um, that are thwarting the individual to be able to access and have full and meaningful participation in their lives. When we use the term access need, we're referring to anything that's required for meaningful and full participation. Everyone has access needs. People with all types of brains have access needs. It's just that there are people whose access needs are less likely to be met by defaults, defaults of society, defaults in healthcare, defaults in education, defaults in workplace. And so when we think about um, all that, that, that goes on in workplace culture, routines, workflows, the way that things are done, um, when there's just one way to do the thing, um, anyone else whose brain does the thing differently is not going to feel included. Um, they're going to feel othered. And so, um, you know, in when I want to get to our interdependence conversation, um, uh, but I, I do want to mention that you know there's there's so many elements of neuroinclusive employment, and when we and 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 uh, you know this is just one of them. Interdependent teamwork is just one of any any number of things. There are all types of different access needs: physical and physical, emotional, communication related, interpersonal. There's all kinds of access needs. And these all play out in all different kinds of ways in different kinds of environments. So what we're going to be talking about, and uh, today's panel is um, uh, part of our staff here at All Brains Belong, um, Sierra Miller, nurse practitioner, Sarah Wilkins, our community programs coordinator, and Lizzie Pratt, our education programs coordinator. We, um, we, we recorded a meeting yesterday, just like a routine staff meeting to launch this project. It was all the things Eve and we had a lot to do. And this was a um, like in real time to be able to reflect on access needs and what are some of the barriers to having access needs met on a team. And so with that, David, take it away. This will be about 20 minutes long and we'll have the Shot box going in the meantime. Okay, team. It's all the things Project Eve. This is my list of things that have to be done in the next several hours. So in full transparency, I am having a lot of dissonance because I am not asking for help in appropriate ways. And there are barriers to me asking for help, namely there are barriers I made up. Number one, 
we work really hard not to um, inhabit and perpetuate urgency culture. And me being like, hey, we got to do all the things. Can you do all the things? Can you do it right now? Like, I want to not do that to other people. So I, I take it and I keep it. And I, I feel it. Like, the urgency is actually still happening. It's just contained here. Um, I also, like, my impression management of, like, what people think of me plays out, like, all day long. I wonder, does anyone else experience that where like, it's hard to ask for help because of like the stories that you're telling yourself about, about it? What yeah, does I that think all three like? of us, all three of us were <laughs> nodding. Yeah. 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 So like, even in a culture where like, we like, co like cortically, like my cortex knows that this is a team that I can ask for help I am still not asking for help right because it's like it, it like lives it, I think it lives in one's nervous system and I think it's I think it's like a trauma response I think it's a trauma response that like dates back to childhood about like all the dysfunctional teams I have ever been part of or like all of the you know the like the feedback around like you know you're there's something about you functioning on a team that is like not desirable right you still have that voice at least i still have that voice in the back of my head always saying oh well if you ask for help then people are going to think that you're not able to do it and they're going to think that you're incompetent um and I think there's also, at least for me, there tends to be a lot of, oh, well, if I ask for help, then maybe they won't do it the way that I want it, and I should just do it myself anyway. Um, and I think that's a really, I think that can be a really hard part about interdependence for at least my flavor of neurodivergent brain, where I like, I like things done the way that makes sense to me. Um, and that's, I mean, that's part of the hard part about collaboration and interdependence yeah for for me my voice is i don't want to be a burden to others and i don't want to put this on your plate that's already full and i should be able to get enough spoons together for myself to figure it out and not be a burden yeah or there's like the comparative thing like other people would be able to do this other people can figure this out so what's going on with me that like I'm struggling right now and so it's really easy to just isolate in the struggle even when you have a team of people that are safe and have shown you that they will show up and support you it's still like you said it's hard when you know all the way back to family of origin stuff you know trying to cortically override that trauma response is really hard I also think, I mean, it's actually pretty new in the big scheme of things. Like that, I don't, I think this is like the first, like, this is the first interdependent team I've ever been part of. Like, I don't have any experience, like actually it playing out. It's kind of like, do you remember that time on New Year's Eve? when we screwed up the link for our, like, our event that was starting in 30 seconds. <laughs> and, like, I, like, never want to feel that again. And I never want to, like, recreate that emotional experience, like, for anybody. But yet at the same time, it, like, I look at my list and it, like, kind of feels like that. And so I'm, like, well, if I just hold on to that and I, like, keep it, it, it feels like like I value so much our team that if I have to choose between dividing and conquering and like maintaining the integrity, like maintaining the team, like I will choose, I will choose the team family every time, which is also kind of dysfunctional. Right, that's the part of working with a with a team that you 
I mean, actually like, <laughs> um, but also just kind of like working with a team where you really respect everybody. And when the, I mean, I think working in dysfunctional systems and knowing that this is something that I don't want to do. This is something that I hate doing. That feels really horrible for me to do. It's really hard to put that on somebody else or to ask for help with that because you know it's a miserable task and you know it's something that, um, I mean, that's the reason that we delegate often is because it's something that we don't necessarily want to or is difficult for our brains to be able to do. Well, that's really interesting, right? Can we like, let's let's stay with that idea because it's interesting that your brain says, I delegate when it's something that is hard for me um like that makes sense it's interesting that your brain does that because my brain doesn't do that my brain mm. says the thing that is hard for me i will keep and i will suffer through and i will slog through it because i can't imagine being responsible for any of my team members feeling the way i feel about this task mm. That that's what my brain says too, and I find that I will reach out to ask for help if it's like really going to severely break my brain. But I won't reach out if it's only going to break it a little bit. Yeah, I think it's one of the helpful things about being in a team where, and I think Mel, you've done a really good job of this for our organization is. <laughs> very specifically asking people what um basically like what their strengths are what is easy for them to do what they're able to do well even if it's not easy and having that known to the rest of the team so like i know that filling out forms and paperwork is something that i don't mind doing and i know other people on the team don't like doing that so i'm fine taking that over whereas making a phone call is something that I really hate doing, but I know somebody else on the team doesn't mind that. So it feels easier to delegate knowing that even though that's something that's really hard for my brain, there might be something that's not as hard for somebody else's brain and it's okay to delegate, but you only know that if you ask. We we have members of this team who don't hate making phone calls. That's new information to me. I think we have members of the team who it doesn't ruin their entire day to make a phone call fair that's fair okay maybe not well, enjoy it but doesn't I mean I think that like comes back to our like our first team retreat like a year ago when we like reflected on you know what are the things that, that like come really easy to you what are the things that like will destroy your day and mm. it's interesting because what I remember about that and like we can go look at it um but like what I remember is when asked in an open-ended way, what are the things that destroy your day? Um, it was actually kind of hard to answer that question when other people started giving examples and someone's like, oh yeah, me too, that 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 destroys my day, mm -hmm. it does. Um, but like, there's so many things that destroy my day. Um, so I think there's, and like, I think that it comes down to like everything comes back to an awareness of access needs and like you don't know what your access needs are you just know that your day has been destroyed and especially when you like have this narrative of like all the times your day has been destroyed and your your the story you tell yourself about that is that there's something wrong with you which is why the day was destroyed because you suck that also i think plays into this I absolutely agree with that. I think that comes back to, I can't remember if it was you, Lizzie, or you, Sarah, who talked about kind of the comparing to people and the, and the, oh, other people are able to do this and get through their day and other people can, whatever, work a 12 hour shift. Why can't I do that? Other people are able to make a phone call and still go through the rest of their day. Why can't I do that? Um, People are able to take a shower and like also work after that like who knew right but but then when you like build awareness like you know when you when you when you think about like the all the things project like through the lens of understanding 
you know, the shower, for example, you know, with the heat and the temperature and the gravity and the mast cells and the, you know, all of it, like, and you're like, oh, like, obviously that's why it costs an entire day's worth of energy to do that thing. But like, there's so many other things, or, or, you know, like when Lizzie and I, like Lizzie, we have so many examples where we like, like things that break our brain, we're aware, like now, I mean, a year, like a year into this, we're aware of like, there are certain patterns that break our brain because it involves shifting between two documents or shifting between two websites. And so we have evolved this, this strategy of like, well, well, we don't do that. We don't shift between two websites anymore. And we've evolved these kind of workarounds that like one person's on one website and the other person's on the other. And you know, I don't know that a year ago, I wouldn't have, I don't, I don't think I would have thought of that. Yeah, I think the first step is understanding, you know, what drains your battery. And that's what All Brains Belong has helped me to do is to like, really reflect on like, what really is giving me dopamine and what is draining my battery here. And it takes, you know, understanding that, in an interdependent interdependent team, like different people are going to have different areas that, like you were saying, Sierra, like that are that are that are work for them and, or that drain their battery. And understanding that, like as a basis of, you know, how to function as a team, and figuring out those workarounds so that hopefully the battery doesn't get as drained. Slowing down and giving yourself permission to ask and be okay if something drains your battery that you're not a bad person and there's there isn't something wrong with you that it's okay that your battery gets drained like that and to not heap shame on yourself is part of the process uh because like there's different buckets of shame so there's the shame of like there's something wrong with me that i need help so like i mean intellectually i think that for me is the easiest one to talk myself down from the other ones are much more subtle. It's like, well, if I ask for help, that means something else about me. It's not that like I'm, you know, like, so, you know, Sierra gave the example of like, if I ask for help, you know, they'll think I'm incompetent. Like, I know you won't think I'm incompetent because I actually don't think I'm incompetent. Like what I, what I think you might think about me is that like I'm a micromanager and like I'm a tyrant or I'm a whatever like that that I actually think is possible depending on how I communicate what I need help with because like those are the messages like those are the ones like when I was when I was a little kid like I didn't get the messages of like you're incompetent like that was I mean there are people who like you know their parents set them down and they tell them that and that super sucks and that stays in your nervous system I didn't get that one but I got the you're selfish you're self-absorbed um all that matters is you your way or the highway so like anything that comes up that gets to those messages like that's what that those are my barriers like, like, I wonder if we can, like, think about, are there any, like, common themes of buckets around the shame, like, the shame barriers to interdependence that we could talk about? So I think part of breaking down the shame is, like, having somebody else to teach you. Like, it's okay to, like, call someone up and be like, hey, can you just be on the phone with me while I'm doing this thing so my eyeballs don't fall out? Like, that, to me, feels like the, one of the first steps is, like, seeing it modeled around you. Well, I've learned about body doubling through All Brains Belong, you know, and, and like Lizzie will call me and be like, can you like just be on the phone with me? Because my eyeballs are going to fall out if I try to do this by myself. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. But like, I wouldn't have thought to do that before, you know? And, and this is the first interdependent safe team I've ever been on. So like, I feel okay to call Sarah and say, hey, my eyeballs are going to fall out, mm -hmm. you know, and I know Sarah's not going to laugh at me or think less of me or anything, you know? It's the opposite. Like, I actually, like, we've talked about this before, where it's like, I actually trust people more who are like, this is hard for me, I need help, or I don't know the answer to this, I'm trying to figure it out. Like, that actually builds trust for me with other people. So it's like the authenticity, the vulnerability, like, engenders trust. And yet, it is still hard to ask for help. Like Lizzie, you gave the example of like, well, if it's only gonna break my brain a little, 
I just mm-hmm. stuff it in, you know, like, I, I, it's only one, like, you know, anyway, so, like, what, what is it about that, despite having, like, cortical awareness that you belong to a team of, like, people who get it, what, for you, what do you think, what's the barrier? Um, I think it still comes back, back to the, to the voice in my head that says you're going to be a burden if you ask too much, right? I don't want to be too much. And those are the right. stories that I had. Too, I was too, too much. Too much, right. Too so much. That, like, that's another Always bucket, too much. too much. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. From yeah. childhood, I'm too much. Yeah. Yeah. You have to stuff it. Yeah. And not be too much. Right. Because if you're, if you're too much, people won't like you. Yeah. I think a big one for me is the like everybody else is already busy. Everybody else is already at their limit. Um, and how to right how to how to how to ask for that help <laughs> from people who um, you know are already approaching burnout or really busy or busy with their kids or busy with their family or busy with work or whatever that looks like and with kind of urgency culture and with kind of over productivity culture, I think it's fairly rare to find people who don't feel like they're busy and there isn't enough time in the day already. Right. And so I think that goes back to that burden. So. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to let Gabe in and then like give them an out if they don't want to be part of this. Oh, and the little thing is going to say, are we recording? Hi, Gabe, do you want to be in the tail end of the brain club conversation? Otherwise, can you leave and come back in two minutes? We're What's happening? Let... We're finishing the brain club recording. Oh. Yeah, for the um the interdependent. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. So, no, it's okay. If you don't want to be you in You want that, to te- text me. Just text I'll me. I'll text you when it's done. Okay. Okay, great. bye. Bye. <laughs> I don't want to loop that in. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, what else do we want to say? The other thing that just, I mean, we'll see if we use this and like maybe maybe some kind of meta application of 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 this conversation around like so. It's actually objectively true that I know I can't do all these things. Like I I know that. I did get organized to at least like operationalize what are all the things that have to get done. I of course did it in a way that is very difficult for it to be shared because it's on paper. Um, I could like type it out and make it into checklists. And in fact, I think I will do that. And then it might just be a matter of like, I think what my brain would allow me to do would be to like, to invite others to self-select the tasks that would not break their brains Mm -hmm. because actually many of them are not they're not terrible tasks it's just that there's too many of them i like that system i think allowing people to to self-select especially if you I mean, I think at that point you need a team who's going to do that and going to be willing to help. But I think that I think that that decreases the pressure of okay, what are you having to do the kind of emotional and mental labor of okay, what are the things that this person finds easy to do? What can I assign to this person? What are the things that this person finds easy to do? And actually taking that off of your plate as well. So people are like people are like in the trenches. They don't maybe they don't even like belong to a team where people talk about this kind of thing. Like where do people start? I think like what you like Lizzie and Sarah, what you guys were talking about about body doubling. I think sometimes finding like that one person who maybe is also struggling or also like you've talked about like has a similar brain as you or struggles with similar things as you or whatever that looks like um and doing 
asking for help in a way where you're kind of helping each other, like doing bottling or or body doubling or creating tasks or um, just talking through things together. I think sometimes that can feel a little bit easier versus, hey, can you do this for me? Of, hey, can you help me do this together? Or can we work on this thing that we both have to do? That's good advice. I think when I think back of like previous workplaces that like the team dynamics were not like ours are, um, like that is, that's a strategy that I, I think I used a lot because it like on, at, on first blush, it absolutely appears that quote, everyone else can do the thing. And then when you identify like literally anyone else who struggles to do the thing, that has like a huge impact, at least for me. And then you like, you know, in real life, like there's a whole lot of people, you have a whole community of people who struggle to do the thing in isolation because you're not supposed you're not supposed to be able to do things in isolation all the time. Like that's the whole point about interdependence. Stop share screen mode. There was I can share over you and shut that off. There we go. Perfect. Thanks. So I wonder, um, I mean, let's, we can actually start with, uh, so Danny, you were so patient um, uh, about, about talking about imposter syndrome and how this plays out um, in terms of, um, you know, if you are in an environment where you, and just, you know, if, if, if that expression, and I think people define it differently, how I experience imposter syndrome is around like, I hope they don't find me out. I hope they don't recognize how incompetent I am when you're like, you're not, but you think you are and you think that, and you like, you, you, your mask is so intense to protect from being found out, even though there's nothing to find out. Um, and I think that is so common and is, is an independent barrier to asking for help. I think for sure. Um, has anyone else experienced that? I wonder if there are other challenges um, in asking for help, cooperating or collaborating with teams. I, I think, um, one problem that has been a big part of my working life, though, has to do when the team or the group of people who have to somehow together function and get things done doesn't really share objectives. And, it, and a lot, I've worked for too many large bureaucracies, and in a lot of large bureaucracies, the the hidden agenda is but the overriding one is really very simple to so sustain the bureaucracy, maybe make it bigger, but at least make sure that this year's budget gets spent and is seen by the people who provide it to be to have been spent well enough to provide more the following year. <clears throat> if your access need is in an environment like that to try to see very clearly what the organization is doing or is thinking of doing, um, and to have the grounds to have some kind of professional take on whether that makes sense or not. <clears throat> professional, the access need is to feel that you can, these things are discussable. But if what you're doing is proposing a discussion or maybe an outcome that is going to slow down the organization spending its money and getting more, you don't get your access needs met and you can burn out and it can be very, very hard. You're talking about a very different environment where basically people are, I mean, their hearts are, are in the same place and their objectives are pretty much clearly the same. But in so many work environments, that just isn't true. And I don't know quite what you do about that. 
Yes. Um, I wonder if anyone has found strategies for how to function in big systems that are oriented all around like perpetuation of the system, not about the individuals in it. Um, Cause that's common. I think. Sorry, or yeah. sorry, just quickly, or about what it actually achieves. Um, I mean, I've worked for organizations that basically they evaluate their own work and tell their funders what they think they want to hear, but the outcome may be, it's not just what happens to the people inside who, whose eye, eye, eyeballs fall out, but it's also for the <clears throat> people that should be helping and doesn't because the, the, the sense of clarity and honesty and professionalism is overridden by the need to per, per, persevere. That's, that's what always used to bother me. Yeah, David, that's really, it's, 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 you're speaking to so many different types of access needs there. So the access need for meaning and purpose, a lot of people have that access need. So if the thing, the machine, the system is doing is not connected to an individual's sense of meaning and purpose, that's an access need barrier. Um, your, your, you, your comments make me think about transparency and when there is a lack of transparency, a lot of nervous systems have an involuntary automatic limbic response reaction to threat. Because if you don't know, if you don't have the information that cues safety, it feels unsafe to many nervous systems. I think there's a lot, a lot that goes in here. Steve stares in the chat, a norm I always insisted on in my staff meetings, be open to outcome, not attached to outcome. Yeah, and those cultural norms, they, they come from the top. Sarah says, in terms of imposter syndrome, yes, for sure. I think when there's a disconnect between your internal experience and the feedback you're being given, about what you should be thinking or feeling in childhood that this feeds into imposter syndrome. Yeah. Could Steve say a bit more about what it means to be open to outcome, but not attached to outcome, which sounds very interesting, but just what how that works. Yeah, I mean, um, what happens, I found, was that if people are attached to outcomes, whether it be in a negotiation or in a meeting, um, it, the meeting becomes a battle of power and who can, you know, bully the other people into um, into their point of view. If you're open to outcome, you might go in with something in mind, but if you lay it aside, then you might be surprised at the um at the good things that might happen, um, uh, you know, by by laying aside your um, your interests uh, for a, for a few minutes and uh, and just uh, uh, you know, seeing what happens. I saw a lot of that going on in the video, and uh, I I always thought it was uh, it was a norm that I learned from the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, and uh, I. Um, uh, I always uh, made a point to uh, say this is something that I personally need to have in these meeting norms. Steve, it sounds like that's another aspect of access needs. So stating these are norms that I need in a meeting um, is so important. And when someone is not in a leadership position and they also have access needs around how something might go in a meeting, there's like different, it's, it, it, and I, I think Steve's point about, about power dynamics is really, really important. And maybe there might be some ways of articulating access needs that are don't become a battle of power that are more subtle.
I wonder if it's also sometimes like a failure of imagination. I think our what what many members of our team and I think this was in the video even of like, if you've not seen a healthy team, you don't been part of a healthy team, you don't like, you don't, you don't know, you don't know what's possible. You don't, it's, so when we think about norming processes or, you know, workplace culture, um, I think a lot of people who have only been in environments of unhealthy culture may not necessarily recognize that it's particularly unhealthy. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. I don't, know if, many, this, okay. I don't know if this is pertinent. This may sound strange, but in the course of all this, I went to a lot, a lot of sort of interagency meetings where people would get together and talk about objectives and so forth. And they were almost, in, the, in those days, almost entirely men who would do this. And I had the occasion to go to one meeting, I can't remember what it was about, where the, it, was, it was the people from the agencies involved who were mostly women. And I was struck at the entirely different tone of that meeting. If something came up in that meeting, that represented a kind of a struggle of power. It was as if a switch had been thrown and everybody was trying to figure out how to get around through this with, in a way that was healing and resulted in, in uh, the kind of respect for the people to, to uh, be open to the outcome, to create an outcome together rather than being attached to it and fighting over it. And uh, it, was, it was really interesting to have had that experience. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I think that um, when, when people have the experience of seeing functional team dynamics, um, you know, there's often, you know, this huge, huge contrast. And if people are used to norms where that's not what's happening, you know, so the next go around meeting where there's power battles and, you know, whatever, whether it relates to you know, any kind of socialized norm or not, I think, um, you know, norms and norming process is really very interesting. Sarah says, when leaders model interdependence and not power over, it trickles down for sure. You know, and power over is, is so, it can be really like, I don't know if the right word is insidious, um, I try to remember that individual powering over is often a reaction, an involuntary automatic action, like like it's it's a dysregulation move. Um, I see this in my child, for example, um, when she's dysregulated. Um, much more likely for, for power over moves. And I think that, I think that's really common. And so, you know, I think back to, um, you know, I'm imagining, you know, an example like David gave, where you have someone who like is motivated to, you know, get information, have discussions about the bigger picture and the, you know, the target outcomes. And um, if you have someone else who is, dysregulated because you know people aren't talking about access needs who even knows what else goes on in that system i think often what happens is you know when when we see a lot of patterns of like supervisor supervisee conflict um it's supervisee seeking to have an access need met and supervisor powers over um and it's that power dynamic that like leads to, you know, someone getting fired or someone getting, you know, transferred or someone, you know, getting marginalized in some way. Um, but it's like zooming way out. I think it's, it's conflicting access needs a lot of the time. It's just that the person with more power maybe has their access need turns into policy or workflow or something. Yeah. It's 
Steve says, um, yeah, conflicting communication styles. Um, and your earlier comment, um, we often get thought of as inductive thinkers who get so caught up in particulars that we can't see the bigger picture. Yeah, that's that's um, that is a myth for many. Um, I beg to differ. We are big picture thinkers who can wade through the vast quantities of data and still not lose track of of important things. Yeah, you know, on uh, on our on our Instagram page, I think a, I think maybe last week or the week before, we had a post um, from healthcare literature um, looking at how primary care physicians um, think about autistic people and uh, the study of primary care physicians. Um, uh, this is Zerbo et al. from 2015 um, within the Kaiser system. Um, that primary care physicians were less were, were less likely. Only 10% of primary care physicians would suspect that their patient were autistic if they um, expressed emotions, showed interest in other people, or could see the big picture. These are the myths that are out there. Thanks, Sarah. A couple of weeks ago, when we began our month-long theme on interdependence, um, you know, we began with unlearning the myth of independence. You know, that the norm of independence, being able to do things by yourself, is is normed from early childhood for a lot of people. Um, and so it's, whether it begins with a family of origin, is reinforced through schooling, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then you make it to the workplace. And often, you know, there's also variables of competition and survival of powering over other people to get ahead. And that for many people, that's the cultural objective in the field or the system they're in. There's all kinds of other barriers that I think did not come up in, in this particular conversation. But um, I, I, I think it, I think it starts with like, I think in a lot of places, interdependence isn't even a goal. It's like not even, it's not even talked about. when being connected to and relying on other people is, is so profoundly normal. And I don't know, I've only been an employer for a year and a half, but I don't know, like, I would think that if, even if I, if, if I were concerned around, you know, outcome or output or whatever, like that a functional team would perform better. That's, I don't know. That's, that's how I would see the world. I'd love to create some space um, for anyone that we haven't heard from yet who might might have anything to share about their experiences or the things they that are coming to mind. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, I have a little something that I was just kind of thinking about. Um, I think my manager has come from a very fast pace kind of mindset. And I was, you know, listening to your um, kind of slow culture, you know, within the office, like trying to implement that myself. And then I'm feeling like, you know, by like two in the afternoon, my spoons are done. I'm pretty much, you know, fried. And I find kind of you know, wrote mindless, you know, things to do um, that are still productive, but it just helps me kind of, you know, chill out. And then she came in and saw and she thought, oh, I'm so sorry that you have to do this. And it's like, it's like, it's so menial. And so, I, you know, I'm sure you're probably just like bored out of your mind. And I said, you know, no, I said, I'm just finding my Zen happy place. And I'm, and she's like, oh, 
okay. Like it just didn't occur. And also I, I'm hoping that over time she'll see that that's still productive. It's, it, I don't have to tell her that my brain is done. Um, and maybe it'll seep into her nervous system and <laughs> chill her out a little bit. But I just wanted to share that. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's such a great example of, you know, first off, it's like, you know, we all have different brains just because, you know, someone would be, you know, whatever. Um, so there's, there's, there's that underlying process, but you're really you're not getting into conflict. You're reframing in a really subtle, you're, I mean, um, the, the, the t- a term we use a lot around here is the oblique angle. Um, you know, when you challenge people head on, they often are much more likely to become dysregulated. Um, but, you know, the, the oblique angle of not a direct challenge, is just, you know, naming the thing. It, it, for 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 in 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 many instances like that that often helps people like strategically get get to a different place without getting into a battle a battle over you know worldview thanks for sharing Brain Club, we've been uh, working to create more more space for people to join join the um, you know the conversation with more space and time you know because of a you know a, 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 a variety of you know we all have different brains with different communication related access needs. My brain is does not feel time. And so, you know, uh, creating space, I feel like I'm waiting like 10 minutes, but I really, I realize I haven't even been waiting a full minute. So I'll keep, I'll, I'll, I'll keep creating space. I actually have another question. Sure. Um, in the video, you mentioned something about um, when the brain like what gives you dopamine and what drains your brain and, and that you had, that you were sharing um, uh, two separate screens. And often, at, often I'm having to look at, I mean, I've set, I have two big screens in front of me and then I have two things going on and they're switching back and forth and you're sliding the thing over and sliding the thing back and you've got like all these things going on. And I thought, well, maybe this is like feeding my, like the ADHD piece. Maybe this is like giving me the dopamine, but is it actually draining? Like what, like what's happening in the brain and what can you just explain to speak to that? There's so much there. So I think I'll begin by saying that absolutely big picture things that give a brain dopamine, you know, whether it's a topic of interest or movement or a good conversation or a thought or a food or like whatever, um, you, something that, that, that gives you dopamine can also drain your cognitive reserves. It's not like one or the other, it can be both. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, I like having meetings with people and co-ideating and then I crash afterwards because um, I spent all my, yeah, exactly. Um, forced monotropic split. Yeah. So, so it's, 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 it's interesting. Oh, okay. Um, I'm being reminded, speaking of, of, of meetings, I'm being prompted to, to shift to the next one, but I would say that um, when shifting between screens, that is a really regardless of like what the, you know, complexity of the task is, it's actually pretty involved to have your eyes have to track between things and like stop, switch, initiate, 
stop, switch, initiate. These are like complex executive functions. So it's motor function, the linear tracking, um, it's executive functioning of shifting, stopping, starting, it's working memory. Like if I'm looking at screen A and it has, you know, a number and then I have to transfer it to the next screen or something, I'm keeping it in my, my RAM of what I, my working memory, what I can keep in my brain um, for 30 seconds to transfer sometimes. There's like all these complex processes that may in fact be quite cognitively fatiguing, but I think the, um, the best the, the the best advice I might have is to just like pay attention to when you're tired, pay attention to when you're exhausted, and think about what did I do today, um, and what did I do this week, and like just to sort of collect collect some patterns. Like I don't think I, um, um, I don't think I really would have known that this particular like type of task would be cognitively fatiguing until I like started collecting these, these patterns. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, and, and as Sarah's saying, flipping the script of like looking at what's not working. So you don't necessarily know what your access need is, but you can maybe identify when they're not being met because you feel bad. Um, and I think this is a, a nice lead into next week's conversation, um, next Tuesday, um, overcoming internalized ableism, which I think is a really important, important part of this, um, as we're recognizing what's hard. And yeah, so anyway, thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for, for being here and engaging in this conversation, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, you're welcome, bye.